self-efficacy is equal to I can. This is the first component of self-confidence. I can do it. Second component of self-confidence. Remember, we are still in the first point. Self-confidence. Second component is self-responsibility. Self-responsibility. Number one, self-efficacy. Number two, self-responsibility. What does this mean? Often when we are talking about confidence in oneself, we forget this side. It is our responsibility. What does that mean? When you we were all children, little babies, boys and little boys and girls, little babies, four years old, five years, six years, seven years old, what you want, you ask your parents. I want this toy, Papa. Hey, Papa will run around and get it for you. I want this chocolate or this particular uh, poha or something. Mics. I want preparation. Yes, Mummy. Mummy will run around and make it give to you. Things you Mummy is responsibility. Papa is responsibility. We can forward it now. We have volunteers. We forward the mics to everyone. You are not five year old anymore. So, Papa, I want this. Mummy, I want this. It will not work anymore. Society will not listen to you. Mummy and Papa also, they may listen to you what, what can be done because daughter and son are forcing. But that those days are gone. You will say, I know that. I am grown up. We feel we are grown up. But deep inside, we are not yet acknowledged that we are responsible for our lives now. What are you responsible for? First of all, your own desires. You want many things. Now it is not the responsibility of your father to satisfy your desires. It is not the responsibility of your mother to satisfy your desires. It is not the responsibility of the teacher or the college or university, not the responsibility of the government. They are not here to satisfy your desires.
God, God wants it, what I am doing. So, quality of your work, you are responsible for it. Third, so number one, you are responsible for satisfying your desires. Number two, you are responsible for the quality of your work. Third, you are responsible for your communication. You are responsible for your communication. What does it mean? Mainly what you say. Of course, what you write also. But what you say, what I say. Am I polite? Am I truthful? Am I clear? Am I forceful? You know, sometimes teachers will come in the class, teachers who are not good teachers, they will come. I taught them in the class. If they don't understand, it is their position. Their IQ is low, they don't understand. I am talking about teaching. That's a wrong attitude for a teacher. Since you are teaching, it's your responsibility to communicate to the students. As you say, it is good to get an idea. It is good to get an idea. It is equally important to get from point A to point B. Getting the idea from point A to point B means from one person to another. That is communication. So communication, you are responsible for your communication. Truthful, kind, clear, forceful. So you are responsible for the quality of your communication. You are responsible for your behavior. Why is this important? Do you know the difference between mother and father? Do you know the difference between mother and father? Do you know the difference between mother and father? Difference between Sarva Palli Radha Krishna and Mother and father? 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 One of the main reasons for this difference between great persons and ordinary persons is this. They have got something which you have also got. One common thing. What do they have? Swami Vivekananda, Radha Krishna, Albert Einstein, everybody. All the great people today also. In business, in politics, in science, in religion. All of them. And you. You have got the same 24 hours that they have got. How many hours in a day did Swami Vivekananda have? 24. How many hours in a day did Einstein have? 24. How many hours in a day did Radha Krishnan have? 24. How many hours in a day do you have? You don't know. 24. What is the difference? The difference is what you or I do with these 24 hours and what they did with those 24 hours. This is the difference. Time management is a very big subject. Remember this much only. My time, right now. My time is my responsibility. He wasted my time. He wasted my time. College wasted my time. Friends wasted my time. Internet wasted my time. You cannot say that. It is your responsibility. Number six. 
my values are not say that which is your nobody else not your parents not society nobody else. so write down my values are my I told an untruth is my thought, my response. If I told the truth under difficult circumstances, it is your credit. So my values are my responsibility. And number seven, last and most disturbing, my happiness is my responsibility. My happiness. Nobody can make you unhappy unless you agree to it. Unhappiness is in your mind. No matter what others do to you, what society does to you, what parents do to you, what teachers do to you, what students do to you. No matter how you react to it, that determines whether you will be happy or unhappy. So my happiness is my responsibility. Seven points. I have not generated this at random. There was a well-known psychologist called Nathaniel, Nathaniel Brandon. You can write down the name of the book, Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. My responsibility. My responsibility. Correct. Third component of self confidence. Third and last component of self confidence is self direction. Self direction. Self direction. Swami Vivekananda said, what is the self-direction? Swami Vivekananda said, have a very high goal in life. Have a very high goal in life. Have an ideal in life. If I ask you, what is the ideal in life or what is the goal in life? I'm sure you can give me a lecture. If I ask you, what is your goal in life? If I ask you, what is your goal in life? Most of you, you know, what is your goal in life? I am not talking about it. Well, why are you studying in this university or college? My mommy put it, papa put me in it. Why are you doing this particular course? Others are doing this. Is it part of your goal? Is it part of your idea of life? 
you know how strange it is when you leave from here and go back to your house house which bus you will take which by which route you will go if you get into a rickshaw or an auto you will tell that auto wala that you take me by this route i want to go there will you ever say by getting on the auto he asks you sir or madam where do you want to go will you ever say just go on every day you will go on you will never say that but when you get into your life you never ask where am i going why am i doing this uh, if you do not have a goal in life if you do not have an ideal in life you have no right to say after so many So, having a goal, an ideal in life. If you have an ideal in life, does it mean you will be perfect? No. Swami Vivekananda said, a man with an ideal may make a thousand mistakes. He may make a thousand mistakes, but a man without an ideal will make fifty thousand mistakes. We have no ideal in life. We are drifting in life. We make mistakes. So, having an ideal in life is extremely important. What will be your ideal in life? Swami Vivekananda again tells us here: Follow your own highest ideal. Follow your own number one, own and highest. Own ideal means you listen to all the lectures. Swami Ji is a great professor. He come and give you lectures here. You read books. You watch on TV. So many things. You listen to people. You should have an open mind. We will take in all things from the society. and then ask ourselves what pulls me what do i like that is my idea and when you will say i like many things i like the film star also i like swami vivekananda also i like uh, abdul kalam also so which one is my idea all these things i like then swami ji says your own highest idea your own vivek your own conscience will tell me that this film star is good no doubt But being like that great person, like Mahatma Gandhi or like uh, Vivekananda, is higher. I like this or like that also. That is the higher idea. Let me do that. Swami Vivekananda said, "Your own highest idea. Follow your own highest idea." Still difficult, I know. One person told me very intelligent. He has done a great work. I tell you about it a little later. One person I know. Some one students asked him, "You have done this great work for society in, in uh, your life. How did you choose this role?" And you know what he said? It's practical, very interesting. You practical. You can try it yourself. When you're deciding the goal of your life, you can try it. He said, "I was not sure what I want to do." He he runs an orphanage for 800 children. He said, "At first, I was not sure what I want to do. But what did I do?" I made a list of what I did not want to. Do. I made a list of what I did not want to become. That's very practical. If you ask yourself, like this profession, do I like it? I don't like it because I don't. I don't want this profession. This type of person, do I want to be this type of person? No. Cross out that word. So what I don't want to be, I can make a list. What work I don't want to do? What type of person I don't want to be? So what I don't want is to make a list. It will be easier to decide what I want. You get the idea. So that is the third component of self-confidence. It is called self-direction, having a goal in life. So this was all discussion of the first point itself. So tell me what is the first point? I forgot. What is the first point? Can you tell me? Self-confidence, right? Self-confidence, shabdha. That's number one. Now we move on to the second point. The second point is three H. Write down three and H English H. Three H dash head heart and hand head heart and hand. Three H head heart and hand. See when you want to achieve something.
something great, you have self-confidence, you have a goal in life, then you must develop yourself. Just as a businessman who wants to start a business, he must acquire capital, he must get funds. Otherwise, he cannot do anything. Similarly, you must all try to develop yourselves. We must all develop our ourselves in three dimensions. Head, heart and hands. Development of the head means the ability to think, to learn, to remember. These are the abilities of the head. It's development of our thinking, development of our mind. Mind training is another big, big subject. And the, so many books are there. I will not go into it. For you, for example, development of how you study. Study. To all of your students. Let me give you a small example. Development of the head, development of the way we study. That's one area. When we read, when we read something, most of the time I've seen students are reading, same page, half an hour, looking at it. They ask, what are you reading? Mind is elsewhere. It happens. Now, how do you control that? How do you make your reading more effective? Have you heard of this formula? S Q T R. We as students we know about it. Yes. Education, we know about it. But you can use it. Very, it's very effective in studying. In any book you are studying, textbook or anything. Write it down. S Q capital S capital Q. Three R. R R R. S Q three R. What is this? How to study? How to read a book? S means S. Right? Give a dash. S. Q&A session at the end. You 
who are required to actively participate and ask questions. Please make sure that you keep your questions precise and relevant to the topic.
I would like to call my friend Spangana to invoke the blessings of the Lord. SST, Dr. M. P. Shia, to welcome Swami Sarvapriya Nanduji Maharaj and present him with a sapling. is the president of Rashtriya Shikshana Samiti Trust, one of the oldest educational trusts that manages RV Group of Educational Institutions as well as RV University Bengaluru. It manages 21 educational institutions with a combined student strength of over 20,000 students. Dr. M. P. Shyam holds a doctorate in logistics and is a veteran automobile dealer across France. He also heads the Karnataka Chapter of Federation of Auto Dealers Association. I would like to request Dr. M. P. Shia to give the welcome address. President of the Ramakrishna Mutt Bangalore, Swami Vikyasthanandji Maharaj. Other Swamis of the Ramakrishna Mission who are here today. I thank all of you for gracing this occasion. The Vice President of the Rashtriya Section Samsung Trust, Dr. Vinod Haikri, and my other fellow trustees of the Rashtriya Section Samsung Trust. Vice Chancellor, RV University, Professor Vyasar Murthy. Narayan Swami, former member of parliament, Mr. W. B. Krishna, Secretary General, Shishadri Puram, Group of Education Institutions, 
other dignitaries. Principal RBC, Dr. K. Shakramanya, and other heads of RB education institutions, deans, faculty members, administrative staff, and my dear students and media representatives. Good morning. It's a great honor and a privilege to welcome Swami Sarvapatyananji and Swami Nityasthanandaji and the other moms of the Ramakrishna Mission on behalf of everyone present here. I also wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone here. Founded by a freedom fighter, Sri Shivananda Sharma in 1940, the Rashtriya Sikshana Samkhi Trust has over eight decades of rich legacy in the field of education. The trust's objective is academic excellence, coupled with social commitment. It seeks to provide quality education to all strata of society. Today, over 20,000 students are enrolled across 21 RB education institutions in a wide range of academic disciplines ranging from kindergarten to doctorate degrees. We want our students to go change the world and are committed to providing transformative education. So far, we have graduated more than 4 lakh students, many of whom are doing extremely well in the government, corporate sector, top tech giants in the US and other walks of life. This is a very momentous occasion for our trust and the RV University to host Swami Sarvapriyananji Maharaj. He has education close to his heart and with the principal of the Teachers Training Institute at Bayoma. Today, we face many serious challenges. Our society is at crossroads and is looking for a powerful navigation system to steer it through various challenges. There is a need to, cha to channelize the most powerful young minds of our country through value education. Swamiji, we are delighted and blessed to have you with us today and we are looking forward to your address on a very important topic of value-oriented education. Your talks and lectures have inspired millions of people across the youth, across the world. The President Ramakrishna Mutt, Swami Nityasthananji Maharaj has five decades of rich association with the Ramakrishna Mutt and Mission in various capacities. He is a great scholar and has authored many books in Kannada. He has translated several books from English to Kannada. The Great Master, Complete Works of Swami Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda, Vidya Sati, Swami Nityasthananji Maharaj, it's a great pleasure and honor to have you at the RB University. You have been able steering the Ramakrishna at Bangalore as its president. We are looking forward to your work with the university. The Rashtriya Sikshana Sankhi Trust and all its educational institutions feel blessed by your visit. You are a great source of inspiration to all of us. With humble pranams. darkness cannot be. Where knowledge has come, ignorance must quit. With this thought, we would now like to request all the dignitaries to please come forward to light the lamp.
Swami Nityasta Mandaji is the president of Ramakrishna Math Bangalore. He is well versed in Indian philosophic thought and is a highly admired monk in the Ramakrishna order. Swami Nityasta Mandaji joined the Ramakrishna order in the year 1972 at the Ramakrishna Ashrama, Mysore. Swami Nityasta Mandaji had Sanyasa Diksha in the year 1982. Before taking charge of the Bangalore branch, he served Mysuru Ashrama as president, as Acharya in the training center of Bilodmat, and as secretary of Ramakrishna Mission, Davangir. I request Swami Nityastananda ji to address the gathering. Education has got two dimensions. One is objective oriented education, and another is subject oriented education. Objective education, we all know, very familiar with. We study in schools and colleges and universities so many various subjects related to the world, chemistry, physics, etc. And other very important dimension of your education related to the subject who studies those subjects, objects. The subject to education is very important. What is their personality? What are the different faculties of their personality? How to develop myself? How to develop character? How to grow spiritually? How to expand myself? These are the most important factors in education. That is why this value education is more important. Value-oriented education is very important for the development of the personality. <coughs> Unless the personality is developed, developed, you know, the character is developed, the knowledge you acquire in the universities and colleges and education institutions, etc., will not be able to lead it properly. As Swami Vivekananda says, knowledge is power. You must know how to handle the power. With a very sharp uh, instrument is given to a most uncultured, characterless person, irresponsible person, what happens? You know, he will use it for destructive purposes. So knowledge is also is a very sharp weapon. So that is why one must have that responsibility, the individual responsibility, social responsibility to wield that great weapon. So that is why the subjective education also is most important. According to the psychology, there are two things existences are. One is Having mode of existence and being mode of existence. Having mode of existence means I have got so, so much of money is there, power is there, so much of bank balance is there, so many cars are there, bungalows are there, so many things are there, so much of property is there. Having, I have so many things. But another aspect is of the existence, of human existence, is being mode of existence. What I am actually, what I am actually, 
I may be having so many things, many things. But what I am actually is most important. How pure I am with him, how much of joy is I am enjoying with him. What is my character? How much I have developed him? What is my personality? These are the things what I am actually with him. That is most important. What not what I have. But uh, it's also necessary. But uh, this is this dimension of the education, you know, personality is most important. So that is why this value education is most important aspect of our uh, education system. That is why Swami Vivekananda says, you know, we must have this uh, character building, man making, assimilation of ideas. Swami Vivekananda always used to say, man making education. We must become man first. There is a nice, uh, very short story related to Socrates. Socrates once asked this question or the students, what are you going to become? What is your ideal in life? And everybody told him, as, as we know, one, one said that I want to become a doctor, I want to become a great engineer, I want to become a president, I want to become so many like, like that, etc. Et but there was one boy was there, student was there, he got up and told, I want to become a man. Being man is most important. In a real sense, in a real sense. So that means Sri Ramakrishna is to say, what is Manusha? Manusha means Manush. Manush means what? Man Bhush. <coughs> Man Bhush means mind ever awakened. Ever awakened. The awakened mind is most important. One must be awakened, always awakened. Otherwise, what happens, you know, there are so many influences are there in all around the world because of the social media nowadays. There are so many things that to drag us away from our idea. So one must be wide awake always. The man, one who is wide awake always, who is able to control himself, avoid all kinds of temptations, and, and always having the goal-oriented, ideal-oriented life, with so much of faith and mind, consciousness, he is real man. So that is why Swami Vivekananda wanted man-making education. Man making assimilation of ideas. So, I don't want to take much time. We are eagerly waiting to listen to Mr. Priyan and Ji Maharaj. So, I don't want to come and be close to himself. So, with these few words, and uh, uh, expecting Mr. Priyan to speak on the most important topic, and I hope we will all be very much benefited, inspired by this speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Swami, Mr. Nandaji Maharaj, for your inspiring address and words of wisdom. Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji Maharaj, Mom of Ramakrishna Order is currently serving as the head of Vedanta Society of New York, USA. He is a highly acclaimed teacher and a preacher of Vedantic wisdom. His lucid exposition of the scriptures has been well received by scholars, students, and seekers from all over the world. He joined the Ramakrishna Math in 1994 and received sannyasa in 2004. He has served as an Acharya of the Monastic Probationer Center at Belur Mat in different educational institutes of Ramakrishna Mission in India and as the Assistant Minister of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. He was a Navarin Fellow at the Harvard Divinity School in the year 2019 and 2020. Swami Sarvapriya Ji Maharaj has been a speaker on various prestigious forums such as TEDx, SAM, Google Talks, and has been invited to speak at several universities across the world. He has played a prominent role in organizing and participating in various interfaith panels and seminars, including speaking at the World Parliament of Religions in Toronto and at the United Nations headquarters in New York. I now request Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji Maharaj to please address the gathering.
Respected Swami Nityasthanji Maharaj, and respected Dr. Sham, Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir, revered Swami Atmavidananda Ji and other revered monks, esteemed members of the faculty, students, staff members, guests. There are actually plenty of guests from outside the institution today, some of whom I, I recognize from the United States. Some I've met just now. We had a wonderful gathering just before this. I'm so um, gratified and grateful to the administration here that they put together this very uh, this amazing group of people. Uh, we just met talking about the future of, of RD University. Uh, people from within the faculty and distinguished members of the wider society. One thing which struck me was that there is this tremendous development, energy, ambition in India today. And you get to see that especially in a place like uh, Bangalore. You know, in the United States, when people say, I hope most of you understand Hindi, right? No. Sometimes they use a little bit of Hindi. I'll translate. If I don't translate, uh, forgive me. So sometimes when people say, you know that uh, what's happening to this country in the United States, this Trump has come, or this has happened, that has happened. I say, you see, in the United States, whatever will happen, it's not reached a plateau. It will be a little better or a little worse in the next few years at least. But if you go to India, every five years when you go to India, you see a new India. The sheer youthful energy in this country, already the second largest in the world and soon going to be the largest country in the world. The country is being transformed, not just physically, infrastructure-wise, definitely. Definitely. But also, more importantly, in attitudes, in values, not all of them may be very good, but some of them are really, really good and they, uh, they, they predict a very great future for our country. And you are at the cutting edge of this revolution which is happening already. By you, I mean especially the young people here. One thing, if I may mention, the thrust that I'm seeing here in uh, RD College and RD, the new RD University, the emphasis on, on value education, on spiritual education, this is most important. This is something that we have neglected for years in India, and we still continue to neglect to a great extent, because the thrust is all on, on engineering and medicine and management, which is great and absolutely necessary. But there should be an equal trust on humanities. This is something that I've noticed uh, by visiting some of the greatest universities in our world today. Uh, I visited, and it's one of my passions. Whenever I go to a place, I want to see if there's a good co college or a university nearby. I go and uh, spend some time in the library, talk to the students, faculty. I have visited um, Cambridge and Oxford, uh, Yale also. And I studied for, I was fortunate enough to study for eight or nine months in, in like one session in, uh, at, at Harvard University also. And one thing I noticed was the importance of humanities. While we are busy giving up our spiritual and philosophical heritage, you know, I was impressed to see the amount of work, the quality of work that is being done, for example, in Indian philosophy at Harvard University. We're literally sitting in class and the professors were discussing with us texts which are being written now. And they wanted inputs from the students, the graduate students. And those will become textbooks to be studied on Indian philosophy across the world in the next few years. But it's being written at Harvard University. It should be written here. So I was really glad to see the School of Liberal Arts and the, the plans that Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir and the administration have 
for expansion in the future. I hope they will keep on giving that importance to the School of uh, Liberal Arts. I know the faculty and dean, are, some of them are present here. The importance is enormous, um, especially in the years ahead. There's no doubt that India already has a great place in, um, in engineering, especially in, in computer science, computer uh, engineering, the IT world. But uh, in the years ahead, we will see that will become a crucial area of importance. Uh, just, I just want to mention that the Ramakrishna Mutt here in Bangalore, you have a great resource here. And all these learned and saintly Swamiji's here. So, like they have a proposal for a, um, a study circle involving faculty and students. And I'm sure the administration will look favorably upon this proposal. It would be great if you have these study circles in your uh, RV College of Engineering and other schools in the RV University in the years ahead. One interesting uh, little bit of uh, insight I can share with you is that uh, some of you may have seen some of the talks I gave at IITs. Uh, you know, who am I? How many of you have seen it? Who am I? So many. So, so many of you have seen it. And I noticed a difference. It's the people in the front, the grown ups who have seen it. I've seen it. The kids at the back are, eh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but take a look. Now, some of the most successful programs I noted whereby these study circles in the different IITs, and the most successful ones were where the student participation was maximum. It's where the faculty was organizing it with the help of the administration. Students were not interested. These are all grown up people trying to force some ideas into our heads, not doing it. I, would, I used to go to those programs, and most of the people so in the audience were either faculty members or their families or okay, others. Never, never, never. Not the students, not so many. But for example, one IIT I visited, and 90% of the audience were just students, undergrad students, uh, you know, engineering students. So I asked, what's the difference? This is some kind of uh, you know, learning or best practice we can uh, learn from them. They said that, uh, okay, the press is here. <laughs> <laughs> they said uh, that this uh, study circle is run entirely by students. And there's a faculty advisor, the advisor is from the local Ramakrishna Mutt, but it's run, it's our program. Um, so that's one thing to learn. One interesting thing is the connection between India's newfound progress and prestige in information technology and other areas. I mean, you're all, especially in the RV College of Engineering, you're all in the cutting edge of this revolution. But the connection with this and Swami Vivekananda, uh, the college was founded in 1963, right? Uh, Engineering College was founded in 1963. That was the centenary of Swami Vivekananda's birthday, 1863 to 1963. In that year, uh, all of India and across the world, they were celebrating 100 years of Swami Vivekananda. But also, much more. You know, I was in New York, in Manhattan, just a few days back. I'm still jet lagged, so I'm not really sure of what, what exactly the time or date also is. But just a couple, two, two, three days back, I was in Manhattan. And a couple of weeks before that, the biggest event, the biggest event in, in New York, in Manhattan, you know, it's called the New York Marathon. And you know who, who uh, organizes, sponsors the marathon? Tata Consultants, TCS. And I told somebody there, there's a connection between me and the, and the, TCS, and the marathon. What is the connection? The connection is Vivekananda. I am from the Vedanta Society of New York. That was the first Indian ashram founded in the West, 1894. We all know Swami Vivekananda went to America in the World Parliament of Religions, 1893 in Chicago. Next year, he started the Vedanta Society of New York in 1894, all that way back. But before that, before uh, New York, before Chicago, on the ship from India to the United States, he met a Parsi businessman, Jamshid Jita. And this Parsi businessman and this Hindu monk who was not well known at that time at all, they started talking on the ship. And what did they talk about? They talked about the future of higher education in India. How interesting. His business, his spirituality. But they're talking about the future of higher education in India. Years later, Jamshed Jitara wrote a letter to Vivekananda saying that, uh, you remember our discussion on the ship? And that letter is still available. It's there in the, in the Institute of Science there. 
I want to start such an institute. And I want you to be the director of that institute. Of course, Vivekananda, um, he did not become the director. Very soon he passed away, actually. But uh, the institute was started. And that became the Tata Institute in, in Bangalore. And uh, now it's known as the Indian Institute of Science. And just by the way, we must, rec I did not know this little bit of history. We must recognize the role that Sister Nivedita played. I did not know that until recently. I was reading an article written by Vinay Lohani that when Tata proposed it, he came to, uh, set aside the money. And neither Vivekananda saw this institute coming up, nor did Jamshedji. Both had passed away before that. When they proposed it, the British government said no. Science is not for natives. So higher, higher education science is not for uh, Indians, not for the world. Sister Nivedita fought for years and years with the British government on our behalf and got the institute started a few years later, with the Tata Institute. Now why I'm saying that is, from that institute, so many people were trained and they went out and started institutes like this, uh, the engineering college, the IITs and others, and the, all these colleges produced you, the cutting edge of the IT revolution in the world today. So the TCS is also a product ultimately of that talk which Jamshedji and Swami Vivekananda had on a ship in 1893, going across the Pacific Ocean from the old world to the new world. That is the importance of being rooted in your own heritage and combining it with the modern. Uh, I know today there are people who have come here. I just met some of them, faculty members, of professors of philosophy, people who are doing PhD in Advaita Vedanta, uh, professors who, who are um, interested in Advaita, in Nyaya. And I know that you are probably, and many others, I know that I just met some of you. You're interested in a talk on Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you a little bit. <laughs> I'll come to the topic a little later, uh, in a couple of minutes. But I just wanted to say that well, there's often a feeling, and often we express it. Is it an ancient uh, philosophy, our Vedanta, our Sankhya, our Nyaya? Is it outdated? What's the point of studying it now? Now we have all these latest subjects to study, and they are more lucrative. Money is there. And the point is, it is a little outdated, and the fault is because we did not cultivate it. See, for a period of two, three, four hundred years under colonial rule, I mean, if you just look at all the children of the great pundits and all, they all went into secular education. So maybe father or grandfather was a great Sanskrit scholar, you know, Maha Mohapadha. Grandson is a doctor or engineer. And, and that happened. It was natural, um, it, it, it's sort of uh, understandable. But we did not cultivate it. We did not develop it. And that's why you one today feels that maybe it's a little backdated, it's a little uh, obsolete. You know, at one time, Navya Nyaya, the school of uh, logic, it was the most sophisticated, so I mean, can't say, the most sophisticated system of logic in the whole world. Aristotelian logic is nowhere close to it. Until the development of modern mathematical logic, Navya Nyaya logic was the most sophisticated, highly developed system of logic in the entire world. Today we talk about late 19th, early 20th century and all. Now we're talking about multi-valued logics which have applications, I think, in science, in computer science especially. The Jaina philosophers were talking about multi-valued logic more than 2,000 years ago. Anikanta Vat, the Syad Vat, seven valued logics at that time. So this kind of heritage we have and we need to develop it. See this, I cannot emphasize it more. With all my, the whatever little experience I have in the East and the West, especially talking to some of the most brilliant minds, uh, students and faculty members uh, in the West also, there is no substitute for standing on, on one's own feet. There is no substitute for uh, one's own spiritual heritage, especially for a country like India, where you have the richest heritage, at least I know in um, spirituality and philosophy, the richest heritage in the whole world, I can say it with, with full confidence. There's nothing that in the world that matches what we have got here in this, in this country. And we need to preserve it, we need to cultivate it, and we need to also update it, which is somewhere, something that the School of Liberal Arts and other, you know, other such institutes, they can do that. And you know, every top university in the West, Harvard I saw, in New York where I am, next door is, is Columbia, 
and there are so many other, Yale is there. All of these Ivy League institutes and many other institutes there, universities, schools, they have uh, divinity schools. Harvard University, the uh, oldest part of Harvard University is the divinity school. Religion, philosophy, spirituality, they, they are cultivated. Study it academically. You don't have to be preach and you know, but study it, develop it. That's at the core of a civilization. You know, one of the most spiritual things I ever heard was not from a Vedanta text, not from a philosophy teacher. It was from Apple, computer, not the fruit. <laughs> you say, what is so spiritual about Apple? I heard this two, three minute talk, two or three minutes only, from, um, uh, 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 from I think one of the managers, somebody who's talking about the philosophy in, at, at, Apple, uh, at Apple computers. Uh, he just drew these three circles. I'll just tell you what I heard, and uh, you know, you will see why it's so important. So this um, this um, ex Apple employee, he just drew these three circles on a board, and the three circles are the innermost circle says why, the second, the middle circle says how, and the outermost circle says what, why, how, what. He said. If you ask big companies, you know, maybe IBM on one end and say Apple, what do you do? I mean, we make computers. We make computers. That's, that's what. So that must be an Apple phone. <laughs> or Android phone. And interrupting, because we're talking about Apple, so Android is interrupting. <laughs> so, uh, what? We make computers. And there's nothing else beyond that. But he says in Apple, we don't do it that way. I like this idea so much. He says, first we start from why. Why at all should we do anything? What is the point of it all? What is the ultimate purpose of it all? So why? Why are we doing something? And he says in Apple, in particularly for Apple, they say that we have this idea of uh, you know, elegance, excellence. That's the core value. How do we do it? We do it through our, um, our products, our processes, our companies. Everywhere it should reflect this inner value of you know, elegance, minimalism, um, uh, efficiency. So that should be reflected in everything that we, everything that Apple does. Not only computers, not only phones, but everything. In our, in our buildings, in our company, in our policies. And then what do you do? Actually, what do you do? Oh, we make computers, we make phones, we make this and that. So whatever product that Apple makes reflects that original why. Now the whole point of this thing was, we should do that for our own lives also. Otherwise, if I just say, what are you doing? Engineering. Why? I don't know. <laughs> if I don't know why I'm doing something, ultimately I'm setting myself up for disappointment and unhappiness. So start with a why. It's an inner, inner personal exercise. This exercise within oneself, just sit and think for yourself, why am I doing something? You know, the reason this why is so important one thing I can tell you, that the people sitting here in the front row, Swamiji, and even the, the person who is a newcomer to a monastic organization, and I'm not just saying our ashram or Ramakrishna Hari. Anybody who takes up some kind of idealistic life, one thing they know, they know the answer to why. That's why you have, you, have, you have taken that step. So since they start with why, there's a much greater chance of inner fulfillment, peace, of being a blessing to yourself and blessing to others in society. Start with the why. I found it personally very profound and useful in my life. Okay. In the next few minutes, I'll just speak of one thing, one takeaway from today's entire talk, which I'm going to speak to you about. If there's one word you need to take away, it would be this word, strength. I'm just thinking, what is the one thing needful in our education systems? It is this strength teaching of strength. And this is what Swami Vivekananda taught. Swami Vivekananda said, the essence of religion for me is strength. If a religion does not infuse strength into our heart, it is not religion for me. Well, be it, he said, I'm quoting from Vivekananda, be it the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita or the Bhagavatam. If it does not give me strength, it is not religion for me. He says, strength is the one thing needed. It's the one medicine needed when the poor are oppressed by the rich, 
when the ignorant are oppressed, tyrannized over and oppressed by the learned, uh, when he says when uh, sinners are tyrannized over by other sinners, the medicine, the one thing they need is strength. Unfortunately, education does not feel, all over the world, education does not feel that these are things that have to be taught in the class. They are taught living. And what we will do, the technical side of it, physics, chemistry, language, engineering, that we are willing to teach as bigger and bigger institutes are coming up. But very soon, we come to this realization, unless we teach this inner art of how to live life, the whole of it, it becomes a kind of a waste. It does not really help. It just increases unhappiness in society. I was just talking with Swamiji on the way here in, in the car that two or three weeks ago, I had a very interesting uh, experience. There's a very powerful body in the United States called the APA, American Psychiatric Association. You know, America has this distinguished record of having largest number of psychiatrists in the world. What it says about <laughs> <laughs> largest number of psychiatrists in the world and largest number of lawyers in the world, in the United States. And this, this is regulated by a very powerful body, APA, American Psychiatric Association. And uh, just by the way, there are two APAs. I got confused actually. One is American Psychology Association, another one is American Psychiatric Association, and they hate each other. <laughs> Both have huge buildings, uh, headquarters in Washington, close to each other. You really easy to get confused. Now, the American Psychiatric Association, they sent an invitation. We want a conference of psychiatrists and spiritual leaders, mostly leaders of different churches in the United States, different denominations. But uh, I was there. From Islam, there was uh, this uh, uh, professor, she's a Pakistani lady. From Hinduism, I was the token, only sole token representative. And one or two Jewish representatives were also there. Mostly other uh, leaders of different churches. And what they said was very interesting. They said that we are facing a crisis in mental health. In the United States. But then just before that, I had seen a talk on YouTube talking about the mental health crisis in India also. So there's a mental health crisis, and very unfortunately, not only among elderly people, middle-aged people, but young people. Young people are feeling desperate, anxious, stressed out, unhappy, <coughs> even suicidal. So these psychiatrists, the, the head, the president told us, we are, we are going to have a partnership between spiritual leaders and psychiatrists. I asked them, generally they don't like spiritual. They, they are completely against all of this. So I said, uh, how come you invited us, uh, spiritual teachers? And uh, they said, look, it's not that we are suddenly have started believing in God and we start teaching religion and spirituality. No, but you cannot argue against the data. You cannot argue against the data. Every survey so, or shows that those who have some spiritual practice, those who have some root in whatever religion, in whatever uh, spiritual tradition you are, those who seriously practice something, meditation, devotion, Vedanta, Buddhism, Islam, whatever your, your path is, if you practice that seriously, the data shows you, on the average, mental health problems are much less, much less. Even if there are mental health problems, the person is able to cope with that much better. So he says, I cannot argue with the data. The president, ex-president of the American Psychiatric Association, after lunch, he said, this, he saw this dress and he said, you know, I was in a Japanese monastery for two or three years in my youth. And even till today, every day I meditate. Who is saying this? Very important to see who is saying this. This is a person in charge of the, of the mental health of the nation of the United States. <coughs> now, of all the things that spirituality can teach us, Vedanta can teach us, I think this one word is very important, strength. I remember I, I once met this monk, young monk, he was sitting there a little depressed, unhappy. I asked him, what's the matter? He said, I want peace. You know, I become a monk, I want peace. And I just thought of Vivekananda, what he would say. Vivekananda would say that don't look for peace, look for strength. If you keep chasing peace in your life, I don't want any trouble, uh, I don't want any hassles, I want peace. You will not find peace and hassles and troubles will chase you. Vivekananda learned that lesson in Banaras, in the Durga temple there. So he was a wandering monk at that time. 
and your big monkeys are there. So generally monkeys are roaming around uh, that if I go in Manhattan and tell they will not be there. How is it possible? There one group of uh, Americans once came to our monastery in Belurma. They were standing there outside uh, the headquarters office there. And suddenly all of them rushed to the wall. Look, what, look, look, gecko, gecko, one dessert. <laughs> but that is something very interesting. <laughs> so this monkey started chasing Vivekananda and he started running away from them. And they were chasing him even more until another old sannyasi was sitting there said, Samna karo, face the brutes. And then he turned around and stood. And the monkeys also sort of stopped and looked, oh, this fellow, he has understood. <laughs> they all ran away. And this is a great lesson that he learned and he spoke about it both in India and in the West. That you cannot run away from your problems. Personal problems, relationship problems. Um, you have to face them. Job problems, health problems, society problems. One has to face the brute at some time. One has to take a stand. Strength is necessary. If you want peace of mind, strength is necessary. If you want success in life, overcoming problems, strength is necessary. If you want success in spiritual life, strength is necessary. How does one get strength? Swami Vivekananda says that if matter is powerful, then thought is omnipotent. Never think yourself weak. There are infinite possibilities in this body and mind and beyond that in the spirit and the Atman. How much has science found, and this quoting from Vivekananda, has only scratched the surface of the possibilities that lurk within this body and mind within, in the human frame. And the way to invoke this, so as Vivekananda says, think well upon every action that you take. Before you work, every work, think it out well. Action is purified, magnified, deified by thought. How to do that? How to evoke this strength which is already there? We need strength. Vivekananda says, Vedanta says, strength is already there. Where? Within us, each of us. And we need to evoke it from within. How do you do that? One of the most powerful, central uh, ways of doing that is to believe it is there, to believe in oneself. This confidence in oneself. So Vivekananda talks about, the old religion said, he who does not believe in God is an atheist. But the new religion says, he who does not believe in himself is an atheist. You must first believe in yourself. By the way, I know everybody understands here. Whenever I say he or uh, Swamiji said man making religion, remember men and women are all included. And all of you understand, nobody is going to point it out here. But I can see the girls are smiling. <laughs> in uh, in United States, immediately they will point out, this is, you must use gender neutral language. You can't use man. So, and big problem in the West now, especially in New York. It's not man and woman, fine. But now there are endless genders. <laughs> you know how many? If you Google it, you find out. In New York, there are 23 legal genders. 23. So, when Vivekananda talks about a human being, he is inclusive, includes everybody. And for convenience, you might say he or man, but includes men and women, he and she, or. Now it's common in the United States. If you insert saying he or he, him, his, she, her, hers, you have to specify your pronouns. So preferred pronouns, they, them, theirs. You can say they, them, theirs also. Whatever it is, that this strength is within us and it has to be evoked through confidence in oneself. So in the next few minutes, I'll just share with you some developments which have taken place over the next last few decades. There's a whole new branch of psychology called positive psychology. So a lot of the things which we speak about in Vedanta and Yoga, uh, a lot of those things are also spoken about in positive psychology. And it's done in a rigorous academic fashion. So they're very interesting developments. One of these things I'll talk to you about, it's about confidence in yourself. How do you generate? How do we manifest the strength which is already within ourselves and use it for our benefit and for the welfare of others? And this is not from some self-help book on, you know, this is a academically vetted, rigorous stuff. One of the leading psychologists in the United States at that time, a few decades ago, Nathaniel Brandon. He wrote this book, Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. 
six pillars of self-esteem. Um, I think, especially young people, you should all read that book. I mean, I know you're not going to, so I'll give you the executive summary here in the next few minutes. But it's good to, good to know these things. And it's something that one can use right away. One sadhu in Uttarakhand, I'm just reminded. People keep thinking, he has come, Sarvapriyananda will talk about Atman, Brahman, I am Brahman, Tattvamasi and all these things. One sadhu said, Mahatma ji, aap to badi bhari bhari baat karte hai, Atma, Brahma, kabhi kabhi choti cheez par bhi dhyan diya ke ji. So you talk about such heavy, profound spiritual stuff, but learn to pay attention to the to the small things, to the details. Otherwise, all that will in Hindi they say, "Kitab ka baat kitab mein rah gaya." Books knowledge remained in the book. What about life? So Swami Vivekananda never said knowledge of the divinity within. He would always say manifestation of the divinity within. And so I, later I thought this word manifestation has two aspects. One, you must know. I am that, that reality is there within me. But two, next we must be able to manifest it, express it in our thoughts, in our speech, in our action. And that's very important. Vedanta, first and foremost, Vedanta is very practical. So, back to our, how do I get confidence in myself? How do I have this faith in myself? This Swami Vivekananda says, if today you think you are a spiritual person, then you start with faith in yourself, belief in yourself, a strong foundation. Very, very necessary. I mean, I, I cannot share with you how many heartbreaking emails I get from the uh, United States, more from India, and many of them are young people. Unhappy, stressed out, despair. I don't know what to do. And the stress is much more nowadays because poverty was there earlier. Family problems were there. Physical problems, health problems, all these things were there. But now you also see there's so many of us, of our, you know, your own friends, people you know in your community, in your family. Oh, that person is working for Amazon. That person is working for uh, what? The Google. What are you doing, you hello useless fellow? <laughs> now this, parents might say that to encourage you. It's not encouraging. It's very demotivating. It's devastating for a young mind. So the pressure is many times more than people face in earlier generations. I know people are earning millions and yet I'm struggling to make a living or to support my um, old parents and there seems to be darkness around. So imagine the stress, the, the huge burden of despair. Strength is necessary. So what does um, Nathaniel Brandon say in that book? In the next few minutes I'll just summarize. Six pillars. He says, if you want this faith in yourself, if, you, if we want this confidence in ourselves, these are the six pillars which support that, that confidence. And one thing I noticed, successful people, students, professors, people in industry, uh, in religion, all of them, they all had noticed, they have these six pillars already. They have not read that book, they may not have cultivated it consciously, but they have it. They have it, these six pillars. First is living consciously, living consciously. Most of the time we are not aware, unfortunately, we are not aware. What am I doing? How is my day going? How am I sitting? Most of us, right now we are not even aware. What am I thinking? Is it at all related to my goals in life, my purpose in life? Or is it just I'm on autopilot, just cruising through? Especially in these, these days of distraction. Yeah. All these, uh, what you have, all of us, we have in our pockets this gadget. Yeah. Some of you may have seen, especially young people I recommend, one documentary I saw recently, a few months ago, it made a huge impact on American campuses. It's called The Social Dilemma. Yeah. Have yeah. some of you seen it? Yes. 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 You should take a look. Don't get scared by it. I'm not telling you you should stop using social media and all that. But it's very good to, good to know what danger we are putting ourselves into. What forces, subtle forces, are manipulating us? All for the sake of money, but it, it is, it's working that way. You, you may often, many of you will probably end up working for those very companies. But nothing wrong in that. But just know, and maybe you can have, you can be a force for good, a force for um, di directing those in a on a better channel. So, consciously aware. Swami Vivekananda said. 
good, goodness will come, power will come, glory will come. Everything that is great and excellent will come when the sleeping soul is roused to self-conscious action. Self-conscious is not a word that is used nicely these days. What it simply means is this, awareness of what we are doing. Unless I am aware of what I am doing from day to day, hour to hour, there is no way of any kind of change. This life will go away. I may have high ideas, the high ideas and my day to day life will not match. Second, acceptance of what I am right now. Acceptance of what I am right now. What is my present standard right now? Honestly, to myself, self-evaluation, self-audit. You don't have to tell anybody. My health, my time management, my morals, my ethical life, my intellectual life, my spiritual life. What is my standard right now? One sadhu in Uttarakhand there, he said uh, very touchingly, he said very simple, simple words. Apni sachai ko swikar kar lena mahatma ji bhaut bhari chiz ho ki. And so, to accept one's own truth, where I am right now. That's a very important thing, a foundation for future greatness. People might say, if I accept, um, I'm such a miserable, useless fellow, how will I progress at all? No, I, I must accept. I'm not a miserable fellow, I'm not a useless fellow. In the tremendous potential is there, Vivekananda tells me. But I must first accept where I am now, and then only the possibility of change comes. Otherwise, the mind is a self-delusional thing. So, it will keep telling me stories. It's all right, it's fine, you're doing good, don't worry. Until one day it will do, do just the opposite. Say, you are useless, you, you are worthless, not worth living. Neither of them are true. The truth about my own life, I must accept first. Mentally think about it. So, the third thing to do is take responsibility for it. Take responsibility where I am now, what I am now, what I will be in future. Primarily, it is my responsibility. I'm using words very carefully. So there's a, there's a, a fashion nowadays, a tendency nowadays, to blame everything except oneself. Why are you in this miserable state? My parents. <laughs> they, those fellows, they are responsible. <laughs> Society, horrible, that's responsible. System is bad, college is bad, professors are bad. What about you? Somewhere in the equation, I have not mentioned at all. Everything is bad because of all these people. Uh, it may be, there may be so many problems, but I am right now talking about my own mind. The poet Milton said, the mind in its own place can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. I've seen so many people, kids, with wonderful parents, very rich, you know, pros prosperous background, getting all the opportunities in life and ruin their life, just ruin their life with their own two hands could be drugs, could be this or that, whatever. Turning a he heaven into hell, just by the mind. And I've seen even larger number of students, uh, young people, very difficult circumstances, really difficult circumstances. And there they are now, professionally, you know, physically, professionally, academically, they have touched the uh, heights, they have turned a hell into heaven. That's because taking responsibility for one's own life. Vivekananda says, what we are today is what we have made of ourselves in the past. And what we do today will go towards making ourselves what we will be in the future. So taking this responsibility upon ourselves, and remember when I'm saying this, I'm not talking about you know, Vedanta or Yoga. This is Nathaniel Brandon, positive psychology, you know, late 20th, early 21st century in the United States. So taking responsibility for oneself. Then the fourth one would be, the fourth pillar is, he calls it, the, Brandon calls it assertiveness, basically the power to be a little aggressive in your own favor. I will say no, the ability to say no to what is below my standard. I have certain standards. I, I want to reach certain standards ethically, intellectually. I will, anything that compromises that, I should say no. Whether it is drugs or whether it is uh, uh, social media, whatever it is, that is, honestly, I see it as a problem in my life. The moment I take responsibility for it, then I will see certain things are not useful for me. And the ability to say no. You know, one of the most interesting things a professor once told me, 
in management studies, in, in decision making. So in decision making, we often think that we have to select something. He actually gave an exercise. Three options, A, B, C. He said, please select one. So I went and ticked A. He said, no. When you select something, when you take a decision, it should be select A and cross out B and C. We must know where to say no. If I decide from tomorrow I'm going to wake up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. or something like that, then waking up at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, cross off. So this ability to say no to what is not helpful, behaviors, habits, people. They are the people who are not helpful. You must have a certain amount of inner aggressiveness, not aggressiveness is not a good word, assertiveness at least, to stand up for yourself in your own best interests, in your own higher interests. So that assertiveness. And then, um, every psychology says this, Nathaniel Brandon also says, most important, the fifth pillar is a purposeful life. A purposeful life. There must be some goal or higher purpose in life. I often used to tell students, and I will share this with you here. Uh, whenever I ask somebody, what is your goal in life, your aim in life? They'll give a nice lecture. You know, Gandhiji said this, uh, uh, then uh, the Buddha said this, or Krishna said this, whatever. What do you say? What is your goal now? Oh, that, nothing much. I have not really thought about it. <laughs> we sort of float along. We float along in the stream of life. There's a funny story of a man, Zamindar in a village, galloping on his horse you know, through the village. A poor man asks, sir, where are you going in such a hurry? And the man, is, uh, the horse goes past and he looks back and says, I don't know, ask the horse. <laughs> <laughs> so we are mounted upon the horse of life and we are being swept along and we don't know where we are going. But that will not do. That will not do. We have a very short time in this world. After you come to maturity, after, after, after 15, 16 years, you are still young. Beyond that, from 16 to 60, it should be our time on this world should be used with purpose, with, with a certain amount of uh, of direction. So living a purposeful life. Swami Vivekananda said, always have a high goal in life. Always. You should be able to say, not to others, at least to myself. Right now, what am I doing? It could be academics. Could be academic excellence. Could be athletic excellence. Could be a, and should be, being a good person. What kind of person should I be? It all comes from that inner circle. Always remember why. I want fulfillment in my life. That's why. How? By being a good person, by striving for excellence. And what will you do in? Uh, what will you do it in? I will do it in the sphere of academics. I will do it in my professional life. I will do it in my relationships. I will do it in my physical health. Everywhere, those core values will be reflected. Not Vedanta, Apple, Apple. <laughs> philosophy of Apple. So living a purposeful life. Again, I am giving the example of the Swamiji's. I, I tell students that. You don't know where you are going, but I can tell you surely. You go into our monastery, the newest brahmachari who has come, who has joined the order today also, up to the senior most swami, oldest swami, the president of our organization. If you ask why, they will give you an answer. We are ordinary people. But lives become extraordinary when there is an extraordinary why. If there is no why, even a lot of resources will go to waste. If there is a great why behind you, in that case, even an ordinary life will become extraordinary in no time. So, living a purposeful life. That's the fifth pillar. Don't worry, I will summarize all of it. So, I'm thinking, what were the other five? Oh, one or two, <laughs> forgotten already. <laughs> and the last one is, um, Brandon says that it is uh, living with some integrity. Living with integrity. That I must be true to my own standards and ideas. That I have set up no matter what others say, I will listen to everybody as the Buddha said. Listen to everybody, read all the books, but finally take your own decision. If you find truth, you find that it is good and true, practice it yourself. So I must be true, at least struggle to be true. Somebody said, I, I have, sometimes I have to tell lies. I mean, that's a great quality if somebody can admit at least that sometimes I'm forced to tell a lie. So I, if I struggle that I will not, I have done this till now, I don't like it, and I don't want to do it in the future. That struggle to maintain personal integrity, your own standard. Everybody has standards here. You may not agree with what the professor says, what uh, uh, 
uh, your father or mother says or community says, but you have your own standards. I, for sure, if I do not have my own standards, it's a sure recipe for disaster for unhappiness. So to be honest, true to my own standard, that will also take struggle. You will see it will be challenged in life. Uh, life will push your boundaries, your um, uh, angle, and you will have to struggle with it. All right, we have got the six uh, pillars of self-esteem, the foundations of confidence by modern psychology. The first one is living consciously. At least try to be aware of where I am, what I am doing, why am I doing it, the three circles. The second one is accepting where I am, who I am right now. Don't have to tell anybody, but I must know myself, be honest with myself. I can't, I have to stop deceiving myself. And the third one is accepting responsibility for it. What I am, to a great extent at least, I am responsible. And what I will be in future, to a great extent at least, I will be responsible. And then, assert yourself. I must be up and doing. That in where I have to say no, I will say no. Where I have to take action to fulfill my goals, whether my friends like it or not, whether my, even my parents or my community likes it or not, my goals are these, to fulfill my goals, I must assert myself. Then only confidence will come on myself. When I stand up for my own purpose, my own goals, then I will get confidence in myself. Then, purposeful living. Have a goal in life, and those goals can change. Swami Vivekananda gives us a very nice guideline. What should be my goal in life? What should be my goal if I have this idea? Vivekananda gives us this very nice guideline. He says, follow your own highest ideal. There are things which we want in life, and many things. Among them, some we know are more noble, more great, more um, you know, moral, ethical, spiritual. That one is your own highest ideal. It should be your own ideal. If you have studied, heard everything, what appeals to you, that you will follow. Your own highest ideal. So purposeful life, a goal in life. And then the last one is uh, the practice of personal integrity. You hold on to one's own standards. These six practices and notice, he mentions, I like this, that Nathaniel Brandon says, practices. He does not say six qualities. The moment we say six qualities, we will feel, I don't have those qualities. You know, I am hopeless. But he says, these are practices. Everyone can do a little bit. Everyone can do a little bit. But that little bit reminds me. I'll do something interesting, which I guarantee you, nobody here will ever forget in their lives. Some of you may know this already. This happened about about 25 years ago, and I have not forgotten till now, so vivid in my mind. 25 years ago, we have a school, Deogar, who is there from uh, Deogar Vidya, yes. So Deogar Vidya, I was a young brahmachari there. I had just become a monk maybe one, one year ago, one or two years ago. And uh, there was a visitor, he was a management consultant. He was just passing through. He had absolutely no time, but I told him that why don't you talk to our students, <coughs> class 10 students, 16 year old boys. He said, I have just got five minutes. So he gave a talk, not like me, 45 minute talk, five minutes. Until today, neither I nor those boys have ever forgotten. And I'll share with you today, and I, I guarantee you, till the end of your days, you will never forget what he said in five, less than five minutes, three minutes, he said. He said, I'm going to do something, I want you to participate. So I also want you to participate. Whoever is comfortable, no force. Just raise your hands. Good. And raise it further. Little more. Okay, put your hands down. Thank you. And this little exercise shows a great fact about human psychology. What is that fact? And I'm just repeating what that uh, management consultant told us. It shows us a great fact about human psychology. What's that fact? That notice that when I asked you to raise your hands, you raised your hands. And I said raise it a little further, you raised it a little further. Meaning thereby the first time you did not raise it to the maximum possible extent. And little kids do that, you know, very enthusiastic. But most of us, we always do less than what we are capable of doing. He says this is a great thing to learn about human psychology. Yeah. And the last, next part of it, those who are from management, you know what he did. He connected it to the Japanese idea of Kaizen. Kaizen. Uh, Kaizen, yes. What is Kaizen? Incremental change. 
incremental change. Make a little difference. Don't make huge jumps. From, I am inspired, from tomorrow I'll get up at 4 a.m. before sunrise. When do you get up now? 9 a.m. Nahi hoga. It won't work. One day you might do it, second day you are, won't do it, and you say, let it be, this is all for sadhu sanyasi, not for me. Now, make an incremental change. If you get up at 9 a.m. in the morning, I hope none of you do, but... <laughs> one sadhu told, said in, in Uttarakhand, he said, jo, जो उठती सूर्य सूर्य को नहीं देखता है उसके जीवन में ज्ञान का सूर्य भी कभी उदय नहीं होगा the one who does not see the sun rise will never see the sun of knowledge rise in his life also <laughs> so instead of saying from 9 a.m. to 4 a.m. go from 9 a.m. to 8:45 do it for two three weeks 8:45 to 8:30 see 15 minute change even my mind will say yes you can do that even a useless fellow like you can do that <laughs> So, incremental change, not just when, when I get up, whatever work that I'm doing, whatever, whatever I'm saying, whatever I'm thinking, in my thinking, in my speech, in my activities, in my work, in my relationships with others, in my studies, everywhere, can I make a small change? Small change is always possible. And those who know management, just look it up. And those who don't know also, it's a wonderful idea. That was one of the core ideas which made Japan what it is today. And then companies across the world have, have uh, uh, taken this up. It's, it's a pretty old idea, actually. Incremental change, not big jumps. Make a small, small change in your life, but do it daily. And then that uh, management consultant, he told the students, head, heart, and hand. How we think, how we study, make a little change every day. What change? You know better. You know where, where, where the problem is in your life. Make a little change, little better today. In your heart, feelings for others, your, stu your students, other friends, your teachers, the staff members, family members, your feelings for them, make a little, make it a little better. Feelings, emotions, and then hand, work, your activities, your studies, your work, your play, everything. Can you make a slight change today? And then do it every day, day after day after day after day. In a very short time, you will see measurable, fast changes in your life. And Nathaniel Brandon, he doesn't mention Kaizen. He just says, all of these six pillars, they are uh, practices. You can make small changes uh, every day, make it a little better. Very soon, within one week, you see sharp changes in your life. This leads to the evoking of strength from within. Vivekananda says, there is an ocean of strength within all of us, ocean of blessedness within all of us. Call it Atman, Brahman, God, whatever you call it. It exists and we should be able to re recognize that and manifest it in our lives, make our lives blessed and be a blessing to others, your family, your institution, your community, to the world at large. Thank you very much. That's what I have to say to you. for your insights on the essence of strength and on value-based education. We will now take our questions for the audience. I would like to request Dr. Sanjay Chitnis, Dean School of Computer Science and Engineering, to kindly moderate the Q&A session. Yeah, please raise your hand and the volunteers will give you microphone. 
Yeah, already we have one question. So tell us your name and uh, your background, the so faculty uh, or this department you're from. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Miras, a teaching in the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I'm a philosophy teacher as well as teaching India studies. I'm asking on behalf of the students uh, because we've been having a lot of discussions in class. One of, uh, one of the things I realized is this tremendous interpersonal tension in families. Because the students who realize, who are in very idealistic, they have values, and then they realize their parents, the shrektas, the elder people, whether it be the politicians or the leaders of the society, are not following those values. And so they feel really disappointed, and when they interact with them, the hatred, the, the anger, the frustration keeps coming out, and I find the students, uh, the way I used to relate to my parents as ideals and listen to them, the same kind of frustration comes to them. So there's a kind of a, it's, it's not a generation gap, it's a generation crack. And what would you suggest is the strength that is required from either side to bridge and cover up this crack. And I'm very, very uh, worried about this because the transmission of values and the tradition takes place to the family also, and from the elders to the younger generation, and this crack is widening every day. And some of us are managing to reach across by making jokes and you know, being entertaining to the students, but the crack is growing. So what would you say is the strength required to push this gap? Uh, I think it would be very useful both as teachers and students for us to listen to this. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't think I have a straight answer to that. It's a very difficult question, actually. And you see it everywhere. One of the biggest crises in, in say, American society is the breakdown of the family. It's devastating. I mean, it has become such a, um, you know, such an inescapable fact that people don't notice it anymore. <laughs> like, many of the kids, I'm, I'm not talking about the kids of Indian parents. I'm talking about the kids of, say, uh, non-Indian, non-immigrant parents there. Um, many are from single parent families. Many have had no relationship with their parents or very poor relationship with their parents. Um, and it has a terrible impact. There's a lot of sadness, misery, unhappiness, mental health problems, uh, effects on the, on the next generation. See, one thing I will tell all of us, including myself, first of all, learn to stand on your own two feet. Nobody's a little kid here. For, the, for little children, it's a much more uh, delicate thing in that they are helplessly dependent on parents. But none of us here are little children. None of us, even the young people, are you're not helplessly dependent on anybody. So stand on your own two feet. Or, what do I mean by that? Uh, as far as values and ethics are concerned, what you find to be good, what you find to be true and beneficial, beneficial to yourself and to everybody else, stand for that. Practice it in your own life and combine it with a little bit of compassion. See, often, especially young people, are quick to be very judgmental about parents. Young people, very quick to be judgmental about parents. Students in uh, institutes, very quick to be judgmental about uh, faculty and administration. See, I've been, having been on both sides, I know the problems. So I, I have been a student, and I have been um, a teacher, I have been uh, principal of a teacher education college, uh, and the Swamiji's here have all held very uh, important positions of responsibility. They shouldered it. So we know the problems from both sides. A little bit of compassion and patience is necessary. You show compassion, you show a little bit of patience, and you will be shown it when your turn comes. So they are trying as far as possible. We might say that, oh no, they are not trying. I could do a better job. Maybe we'll have to wait and, and see this <laughs> until that time comes. But right now, they are doing the best they can. Um, and ultimately, it's your life. You cannot ruin your life. Suppose you say, my parents or my teachers or people in society are not showing a good ideal to me. Fine, do it yourself. Show a good ideal to yourself, to your, your classmates, and to the future society. One thing we will learn when we try to do that, actually live these things ourselves, is we find how difficult it is. It's always a struggle. And it's always dissatisfactory. Very soon you will see the next generation, your next generation will be criticizing you. Very soon. So uh, follow one's own ideals, stand for them. Then only self-confidence will come. But also combine it with some patience and compassion for uh, parents, for elders in society, 
for institutions. That does not mean you will give up the desire for reforming it. You will go on and society wants you to uh, reform what is uh, problematic in society. But uh, combine it with, otherwise just anger, you know. There are people who are idealistic. We have seen this. There are people who are idealistic in society. They stand up for certain values and they feel, I don't care for anybody. All these fellows, they, they are, somebody is corrupt, somebody is bad, and I don't care. Very soon what happens to such people is they get isolated. In society, you have to work with people. Often, I'll tell you, from speaking from your side, as uh, what I used to feel, the, the mistake that we make as young people is that we think people in charge, parents, faculty members, um, administrators, or politicians in society, bureaucrats, they're in charge. They've got power. They can change everything. Why are they doing wrong things? Not true. The moment, the moment you get charge of something, you get the power over something, you realize power is something very interesting. Power means you have to work with a lot of people. Swami Vivekananda says to be a leader means to be a servant. Literally, you have to carry a thousand people with you. Even in a military organization, the major service here, there also, uh, you, you cannot control people like robots. You must show, insp inspire people into action. So, to be a leader, to be a head of a department, a college, a government department, or a ministry, or something like that, wherever you are in, in power, you will see you have to carry a large number of people with you. One thing we don't do in this country, it's changing, everything is changing in this country, in our country, but it's, uh, one thing is that giving responsibility to students. I saw they do it from kindergarten onwards in the United States. So some kid is made in charge of making sure all the kids cross safely the road. The moment you do that, one thing you learn, it's not easy being in charge of other human beings. They are, even if they're kindergarten kids, they're not going to listen to you. <laughs> so then you learn patience. Then you learn to expand yourself so that you can accommodate uh, more people. I don't know if that's a good answer. Um, strengthen yourself first. Confidence in yourself. More confidence I have in myself, the more compassionate I'll be to other people also. Okay. Tell us your name and ask the question. And tell us a little bit about yourself, which is your background. Hello sir, so I am Palaksha from, uh, I'm studying final year in uh, CSE in Adi uh, College of Engineering. Uh, so I've seen your video on the Bhagavad Gita and uh, I think mean, that's a tremendous video, the verses that you have picked uh, made a lot of sense. But when I try to read the Gita myself and in the initial few chapters of the Gita, uh, there are some things that he, uh, Krishna says. Uh, he says that intermixing of castes is a sin. He says uh, that you have to offer, give offerings as yagna to the God for uh, your uh, task to be not complete. So there, there, there might be other interpretations for it, but it, al it also means materialistic offerings in some, some places. Yes. So when, uh, like, I see that there are some uh, very interesting things that we there are to, to learn, but when there are these factors as well, uh, the first doubt that came to my, my mind is, is this still relevant today? Or what part of it should I take? What part of it should I not take? Yes. Where do I start? And if I'm not going to be a monk, how do I uh, start learning it? And how, 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 how exactly should I go about reading the Gita? Right. Thank you. This is a very good question. Really. Thank you for that. Um, remember, first of all, it's a book thousands of years old. And society has changed tremendously over the millennia and centuries which have followed the, the, the Bhagavad Gita. I'm sure if Krishna had to give that advice today, he would have made certain changes. And surely. Also notice, if you read the Gita carefully, talking about caste, inter, uh, inter evils of intermixture of caste, and who said that? Arjuna said it, not Krishna. Now, that was a kind of social understanding in those days. And those days have gone. Is it necessary to hold on to those things? Swami Vivekananda says very clearly, he's asked about caste. He says caste is a feature of, uh, of society. When there was some need for it, and at that time it arose, when the need for it goes, it will go away. I can proudly tell you, I am a monk, I am a Hindu monk, as all of them are, and we don't believe or practice casteism. None of us. Absolutely not. So, yes. 
so the word use is varna actually not the, so, so the, we are using english language where there is a translation issue true so those things are there but there, there is a lot to be discussed but let's be overall let's be very clear yeah. so uh, the privileges and hierarchies which were associated with caste uh, those are are going and they are, uh, they are sooner they go the better now uh, the thing is of course what you what sir just said if you notice the discussion of caste by krishna also later on when krishna talks about caste he says these are differences among human beings and the differences are in differences of occupation and nature the uh, natural tendencies never he never meant the actual stratified rigid social distinctions which came up over centuries or right. uh, i mean it's a big big topic but luckily we are in this country over the last um, 100 years or so we have made a huge progress uh, in in these matters huge progress sometimes i have to interview i have to introduce hinduism to students in the united states and so one of the questions they sometimes ask is this so for example they'll ask what are the problems with hinduism and what changes have come in hinduism how what have you done to tackle it you not me personally but you as hindus so one is i always say the problem the caste question another one is the condition of women swami vivekananda said the two great causes of india's downfall are the neglect of the masses uh, and the oppression of women or the other way around oppression of the masses and the neglect of women two great cause national sins of india he said but on those two fronts also we have made enormous progress over the last uh, century and there is more work to be done and it will be done it is being done um, the second thing which you asked was uh, about i'm sorry yagya no yes again remember that was the form of hinduism in those days and you make offerings to the vedic gods and your desires are fulfilled and those desires are either this this world the lokika or alokika after death i will go to heaven a uh, nice word nice place to stay uh, so this this was this was the uh, idea and is this so outdated the thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people who turn up in the great temples especially the most ancient temples are uh, here in the south out of those millions and millions of people how many are coming for brahma gyana moksha nirvana not many many are coming let me take the blessings of the divine mother or uh, uh, or the narayana uh, blessings may let my life go well let my family be healthy let me be prosperous and let me get uh, that uh, nice packet and uh, the multinational corporation job all of these i have desires so this is the kind of conventional religion you will find it in every religion of the world in every religion it's very natural for human beings in the one word used abhyudaya Uh, welfare in this world and religion talks about it shankaracharya in his introduction to the commentary on the bhagavad gita he says dvi vidho hi vedo vedokta dharma pravritti lakshanasya nivritti lakshanasya vedic religion has these two parts one is for welfare in this world this world and the next world you might say this is materialistic it is it is materialistic how can you live a materialistic life in a sustainable way not non damaging way which will be helpful for your future spiritual progress but those of us many here you are here that means you are interested in the higher spirituality uh, nishraya sha moksha liberation so that is a non materialistic higher uh, religion higher spirituality and that is krishna's central message you will see whenever he talks about offerings in in vedic yagyas and all he keeps on saying that has to be transcendent you have to go beyond that Uh, the three, three gunas that's the realm of the vedic karma kanda you have to be uh, gunatita you have to go beyond gunas to attain moksha liberation whatever it is yes uh, hello yes so uh, it is said that when we mix uh, thought with an emotion and uh, desire it can be achieved tell us your name first aditya the mic Yes. So it is said that when we mix uh, our thought with an emotion and desire, any objective goal can be achieved. But uh, the problem is with the thought. We get around sixty thousand thoughts in a day. And uh, when a billionaire, uh, his name is Andrew Carnegie, he was asked means uh, why you are so successful. 
he said that I can concentrate on single thought for five minutes. So how to concentrate on thoughts, on a single thought? Mm. It's a big, big question, very little time. <laughs> you know, but he has raised an important point, Aditya. I talked about one of the ways to evoke strength from within, which is self-confidence. Vivekananda talked about that, and I used uh, Nathaniel Brandon's work. But there is another important thing which leads to the manifestation of the strength from within, which is focus, concentration. And Swami Vivekananda was very big on that. Again and again he said that the key to success and the key to all knowledge is concentration of mind. And we should all learn the art of concentration. What I did not know that quote from Carnegie, but he said it, I'm, I'm quite sure. So there is a huge amount of work being done right now on the psychology of concentration, psychology of attention. Especially in this day and age, this device is just the opposite of concentration. <laughs> One sadhu, we called it Karna Pishat. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, it, it is, and it's, it's uh, admitted now. One thing I used to do, I was a student, uh, I was studying for a few months at, at Harvard, so I wanted to see how education has changed over the last uh, 30 years. I haven't been in a college and, uh, since I finished my education long ago. I've been there, but I've taught, but not a student. And I wanted to see how it's done in the best institutes in the world. One thing I noticed was this, this phenomenon of intermittent attention. It's not that people are not listening to you, they are, but once in a while. They're listening to you, then looking a little more up what's going on there. From there, something else. Ah, the next listening to you again. <laughs> in classrooms, in boardrooms, in meetings, everywhere, this, this is called the phenomenon of intermittent attention. It was not there earlier. It's happened in the last 10, 15 years. Um, the person who popularized the term EQ, emotional intelligence, uh, Daniel Gullman, uh, Daniel Gullman, he's written a new book, Focus. And he says that I'm worried because teachers, uh, executives of companies, everywhere they're saying that there's a, there is a crisis of attention. People are not paying attention. See, Aditya will be saying, yes, that's what I'm asking, how to pay attention. <laughs> that's a big topic. Um, what is attention? What are the determinants and how to control it? Not just from yoga perspective, from modern, modern uh, psychology perspective also. There was this person, I can recommend a few books, you take a look. Um, one, the best one is Flow. There was a psychologist, Mihai Chikzen Mihai. I think he's passed away now, recently, probably. I'm not very sure. Um, if you don't want to read the book, you can look at his, uh, his TED Talk. He's not a very impressive speaker, but what he says is very important. He spent his life studying psycho uh, this, the psychology of attention. And interestingly, in that book, in one place, he mentions that Patanjali Yoga Sutras, ancient Indian uh, uh, manual of meditation. That is the best book on flow that I've come across in my survey of flow on, in, uh, in all the literatures of the world. So flow, just the word, F-L-O-W. Even if you don't read the book, just catch the talk on, on YouTube. I think he gave a, a talk on TED, uh, on, on a TED talk. That will tell you what is attention and the psychology of attention, how to control it. Another book is Focus, Daniel Goldman. Another book I read recently, Cal Newport. It's called Deep Work. Deep Work. If you just look at that book, very interesting things, especially for people who are in academics. He's himself a professor at MIT. And uh, he has said, just the word itself is interesting, the phrase, the two words, deep work. How to give undivided attention to something and produce work which cannot be easily replicated. And he says, in this day and age, it is very important to do that. He gives an example. You see some songs on YouTube, a million views. Some songs on YouTube, he gives this example, have billion views, 1,000 million. Now, will you say that song which has billion views is 1,000 times better than this song which has million views? How can one song be 1,000 times better than something else? It cannot be. And yet, all the attention goes to one and everything else gets very little attention from everybody else. Why? He says in this day and age, what the internet has done, the World Wide Web has done, has made everything accessible to everybody. So I remember, I understand that very well because I, I'm from a generation before this uh, uh, internet. So I remember when we were kids, 
What books could I choose? Those books which were available at the local bookshop. That's it. What music could I hear? Though we had tapes, audio tapes. Those which were available uh, in the local uh, cassette shop. That much. But now what books can you choose? Now what music can you listen to? Everything across the world and almost instantaneously. Now if you want success, earlier what happened was success was sort of distributed. Some people got a lot, some people got less, but uh, access was not equal everywhere. So whatever people accessed out, out of that, all authors, all singers got some attention. But now because everything is instantaneously available to everybody and our time is limited, our attention is limited, what do we want? We want the best. So if this one seems to be good and everybody likes it, I will listen to this one. Then I don't have much time. Then that one starts getting attention from across the world and everybody else gets much less. So the difference between good and not so good becomes vast. Actually, the difference is not so much. But the actual success will be, huge difference will be there. And this difference, he says, how can you do that one? You have to work a little better than everybody else. And for that, he says, concentration is important. The crucial factor is focus, attention, concentration. He gives many such examples. Uh, deep work, Cal Newport. So take a look at these three books, Flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Um, then um, Focus by Daniel Goldman and Deep Work by Cal Newport. Do you have questions? <coughs> Just hold it perpendicular like this, then it will come better. Tell us your name. Sir, you please. Good morning, sir. I'm Sahana from uh, Computer Science of Computer Science Department. I'm working as a TA. Uh, so my question is, uh, six pillars of self-esteem. Uh, the, th the fourth one is ability to say no, the assertiveness. It's really hard to say no sometimes. Like, how do we carry it? How do I carry it sometimes? So, and then the purpose for life. I get stuck in, I, st I get stuck between uh, <coughs> two goals in my life. So how do I prioritize one among them? That is my question. So two questions. One is, how do I say no? It's very difficult to say no. And the second one is, how do I prioritize my goals? I have goals. You are lucky. You have some clear goals. And how do I prioritize? The first one is hard to say no. You know, that is one problem you won't understand here. I've seen executives, professors in the United States. That's one complaint they have against Indians. Is that <laughs> you don't want to do something, you don't agree, say it. But they feel uneasy. How can I tell, sir? <laughs> I don't agree. Whatever he says, yes, sir. Well, internally, no, sir, but yeah, externally, yes, sir. <coughs> don't worry, people will not mind so much. And this is one little change I found in myself also. Uh, it's uh, easier and simpler to state it politely that uh, you don't agree. How do you do that? You won't believe it, but we, um, we should not talk about our past, but I actually studied, uh, I did my MBA before becoming a monk. So, one of the courses, we had a course on how to say no. <laughs> it was called AT, Assertiveness Training. Assertiveness Training. Somebody joked, it is teaching you how to be rude. <laughs> how to be impolite. Especially people in India, and especially people in the South. Uh, I've seen places like uh, Chennai, uh, Bangalore, People are very polite, very soft-spoken, very good people. And you find a, find a uh, inner reluctance to hurt other people's sentiments, especially seniors. It could be parents, could be professors, could be your boss, your project leader. Uh, so how do you say that? Remember, a couple of things from my old AT training 30 years ago. One thing I remember is you always have the right to ask. Suppose you want something. You have a right to ask. Don't first start thinking what they will think about me. <coughs> Forget that, what they will think about me. If you really need something, some cooperation, some kind of help, you have a right to ask. Remember, they also have a right to say no. But you have a right to ask. Often, especially us as Indians, I understand the problem. I have the same thing. That we feel we don't have the right to ask. We feel somehow I'm imposing myself on others by asking for something. You can ask. 
and they have the right to say yes or no, and I should be fine with either of that. Second, you have the right to say no to everything. You have to take the consequence of saying no also. That's there. It's not that I will say no to something and then nobody will be unhappy with it. They can be unhappy, but if I want to say no, I should be able to say no. And a good organization, good family, good classroom, good um, uh, uh, company functions on these two abilities. The, the freedom to ask and say what you want with full understanding. Otherwise, may, my boss may reject it. Just because I'm saying does not mean he or she has to accept it. And also, the full freedom to say no. Good companies, good organizations, good families foster this culture. The second thing was prioritizing. Something that I learned from a gentleman who runs a brilliant man. He, he got a degree from uh, IIT, he got a degree from IIM, but he did not go into a corporate career. He runs this organization which takes care of 5,000 uh, orphan children. And President's Award winner and all that. And wonderfully run. See, I noticed one thing. NGO also, if you have to run properly. There's so many people who are running NGOs, uh, taking care of kids. Fine. But if you want to run it properly, see the same training which you get in an engineering institute, in a management institute, that helps you to do the social work better also. Not just companies. So I learned this from him, is what you ask. How do I prioritize? He said, if you cannot prioritize, then ask yourself, um, what is it that I don't want to do? If I have to sacrifice one of those two, which one would I sacrifice? Which will make me unhappy? Suppose I think, goal one and goal two. Now I don't have goal two in my life, I have only goal one. Do I feel happy or unhappy? Or I don't have goal one in my life, I've got only goal two. Do I feel happy or unhappy? You look at your emotion, not logically. Look at it psychologically. Pursuing goals, very important. Pursuing goals in life depends more on the heart than the brain. Selecting something is intellectual, but heart it has to be consulted because you have to pursue it with a lot of effort, overcoming obstacles. You need psychological energy. And only if, the, if you want it from within, then only you'll be able to follow it. See what is it that makes you deeply unhappy. I don't have that goal anymore in my life. I feel unhappy. Then I should prioritize that. I hope that helped everyone. Thank you, sir. Um, do you have any time? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll put five minutes. We'll take one or two questions. Yeah. Quick. Good morning, Snowy. I'm uh, Navnita, first year BA student from Ali University. My question is regarding balance in life. Because we as students, in the short time that we have, we indulge ourselves in academics, in sports, or other curricular activities. How do we do justice to everything that we are indulging in? Uh, how do we achieve that the heart of balance in life is my question. Again, I will cheat and take the shortcut by recommending a book. <laughs> See, if you have a goal in life, the art of balancing becomes easier. So I have, we all as monks, we have a goal in life. Atmano moksha artham jagatita spiritual um, a spiritual life, God realization is our goal. And how do we do it? In two ways. One is our own spiritual practices and welfare of others. Now I can prioritize, I can balance. In my life, my activities throughout the day, am I making progress towards that goal or are many of my activities wasteful? Then at least I will know what to prioritize and how to balance my life. Balanced life does not mean, important point, balanced life does not mean every activity should have some time. No, it, should, it means what is important for me, that should get maximum time. That is a balanced life. Imbalanced allocation of time is a balanced life. Yes. Those, it's a simple uh, idea, and I got it from actually from Stephen Covey, that uh, I, you know, he, he has written seven habits of highly effective people. One chapter is there. I recommend that chapter only. It's, it's on, uh, I think I don't know the name of the chapter, time management, whatever it is. Missing time management is I have a lot of things to do, how to find time for all of that. No. He said time management is those things in your life which you really want and yet those are not urgent. Those for that you have to take out time and consciously give time for that. So suppose there are some things which are urgent in my life. The phone is ringing right now. That's urgent, you have to answer it now, otherwise it will not uh, ring afterwards. But it may not be important. 
So knowing the difference between urgent and important is, is, is there's some things which are important and urgent. A family, somebody has a medical emergency. That is urgent, you have to attend right now. And it's important also. But the crucial thing, this is the, this is the idea. The crucial thing is, there are certain things which are very important in our lives, but not urgent. And therefore, those things get ignored in life. And at the end of 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, I feel that my life is wasted because I did not do what I should have done in life. So what is that? For example, I feel yoga is important for physical health and mental well-being. If I don't do yoga today, will it be disastrous? No. Tomorrow, if I don't do it, will it be disastrous? No. But 40 years, if I don't do it, it will be disastrous. Somebody says, I'm an academic. I know I should do a PhD, but I have a job now. Too much demand is there uh, around my time. I am not doing PhD. Is PhD important for you? Very much. Is it urgent? If I do start doing it, don't do it today, will it be disastrous? No. But if I don't do it for 25 years, time is gone. So this insight, always be aware of what is important and what is urgent. Normally, what is urgent takes up our time. It could be a useless thing. Some phone call, some social media, it has to be done right now. Update. Swamiji, my latest uh, Facebook update has to be done today. If I do it 20 years later, what is the use? <laughs> Facebook itself <laughs> it may not be there at that time. <laughs> but that is unimportant. It may be urgent, but not important at all. What is important may not be urgent, and it gets neglected. So they um, found something important in their life. It could be writing a book. It could be building a business. It could be God realization and moksha. They found it important in their lives. And they put all their time into it and uh, give almost nothing, uh, no time and energy for anything else. And then they achieve greatness. Yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> Can I have one more question? Last question. Okay, at the back. Yeah. Hello, sir. I'm uh, Smaran from uh, BTEC. Yes. I'm a student of RVU. And uh, how one uh, main question I want to ask. The thing is, uh, a lot of people may face this already. Um, uh, don't mind me actually reading it out because uh, thoughts are not solid in my mind. Yeah, so, uh, this is like a fear of missing out or FOMO as people say. It, uh, it brings out a lot of uh, fear into building new relationships. For example, we're, we're entering a new stage of life, that is college. Uh, we want to build new friends, new besties or in some cases new crushes or other uh, love lives, so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, if we uh, see their interactions with other people, sometimes we feel like we not being a part of uh, you know, influencing our uh, character or our, uh, you know, how we are truly. And we kind of uh, morph ourselves into some other people, uh, some other character and assert that. Uh, one thing I want to ask is how do we uh, build new relationships stably and how not to fear uh, like how not to fear about what happens in the future and how not to be afraid of what is happening. I think I, I get it. It's a, it's a relevant question. A lot of young people want to know this. I'm not the right person to ask him a monk, you know. So, okay. <laughs> but, yeah. but let, me just, let me just tell you. Let me just tell you. I, I heard this a uh, few months back. Somebody was saying there's two serious problems in Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, and many of them are Indians working there. Two latest two big problems: FOMO and YOLO. FOMO is fear of missing out. We have to do this, that, go there, see this, and take part in this activity. Otherwise, I will miss out something. FOMO. And YOLO is you live only once. You live only once, so you have to do everything. <laughs> yeah. And then they, the, they said there is a new solution to all of them. Again, Silicon Valley. What is the new solution? Solution to all these problems? Jomo. What is jo Jomo? Joy of missing out. <laughs> so, that is the philosophy we have taken. As, uh, you know, joy of missing out. But that is the, not just for monks, for those who are heavily involved in you know, personal life, uh, your academics, your uh, social life, your professional life, there one must learn this art of saying no. That you can't do everything at all the time and all the, uh, at, at all at the same time. It does not increase your personal happiness. And as you yourself noticed, 
it is not really building up me as a person. It increases tension, unhappiness, frustration, and a kind of life becomes a bit of a mess very fast. So if you want to build up a, a sustainable life, something that is better every day, that requires a careful management. Management of your personal time, management of relationships, management of your academics, management of uh, your professional life also. So remember this philosophy of JOMO, joy of missing out. Learn to say no at certain points. Then what you will get will actually be helpful and, uh, and uh, fulfilling. You will feel better about it. I guess that's what I can say. Huh? There was one lady here who wanted to ask her. That last one. Yes. Uh, Swami, School of Business. School of Business. School of Business. So, uh, just ask that which is the insightful story of Swami Vivekananda which inspires everyone, like all the youth students? An inspiring story, but just look at the life he led. You know, Swami Vivekananda, uh, he is, um, uh, his birthday is the National Youth Day, 12th January, National Youth Day. And the reason is he passed away a young person. He used to say, I won't live to see 40. He, uh, he passed away at the age of 39. What a, just think about it. We don't study these things in detail, but what a tremendously inspiring figure. Whatever he did in 10 years, in 10 years, from 1893 to 1902 when he passed away, this young man, virtually unknown from a colonized country, at that time looked down upon by the world, he goes to the West. He does two things. One, he opened up the doors of the world to this inflow of Indian wisdom, starting with Vivekananda till today. The continuous stream of gurus and swamis and lamas and yogis, all our, our spiritual treasures, whether it's yoga, Vedanta, Buddhism, Vipassana meditation, mindfulness. Mindfulness is a huge thing there in, in America now. All of this has come. Who started it? Whose dream was it? Vivekananda. He started it there. And it has continued since then. Tremendous effect from the West. Just recently, uh, <laughs> Professor Ruth Harris, she's a, a, a historian at Oxford University. She wrote a book, Guru to the World, especially concentrating on the effect on Western women in, in America and England and all at that time. Um, I asked her, how did you become interested in Vivekananda? Your, your sphere of uh, expertise is early uh, early modern French history, 1920th century French history actually. She said, I read Roma Rolla, and Roma Rolla talks about Vivekananda. From there, I read the letters of Vivekananda, and she said, I was hooked. What an amazing character. So that's one side of his achievement. The second side is when he comes back to India, and he gives this call to us, his countrymen, to uh, awake from the centuries of slumber into a, into a notion of nationhood, selfhood, and the greatness of this country. And look what it did. It started the entire freedom movement. It kick-started the entire freedom movement. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru himself says, in our generation, all of us, we read Vivekananda. And Mahatma Gandhi says, my love for my country has multiplied thousand, a thousandfold by reading Vivekananda. So Vivekananda put a, an impulse of uh, awakening into our own country. And all of this he did in 10 years. No wonder he's the national youth icon. And there's nobody who comes close to him. He's the true giant of our century. I'm quite sure as the centuries go by, all the people who lived in this last century, 20th century and all, they will slowly become shorter and shorter and begin to vanish into history. Vivekananda will become taller and taller. He will represent our time, the time of 20th century and onwards, to the future centuries which come. This is my belief. years ago which we have seen the, the amount of degeneration there was the amount of hopelessness there was the amount of depression there was compared to that whatever the problems are this is a society on the track to greatness Swami Vivekananda said I see the future India rising it will be far greater greater it will touch heights of glory far greater than the, uh, even the most glorious past of India and I'm sure if you see India especially from a distance if you see India you will see that this is this country is the future. India is the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think also a lot of questions are still there. So as Swamiji mentioned, we are going to form 
Uh, Vivekananda Study Circle. Uh, already people have given uh, online responses for registration. So those who are interested, etc. So I think in that, a uh, lot of your questions will get answered and it will take you forward in your self-development journey. And uh, we have our local guide also from Bangalore, uh, Nitya Sanandaji. So we'll take their help also no, to take it forward. So thank you very much. So thank you again for your question answers. Over to our answers. I would now like to request President RSST, Dr. N.P. Shyam, and VCRB University, Dr. Vaisar Murthy, to present a memento to Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji Maharaj. Sir, in the side for Vaisar, sir. Excuse me, sir. Sir, in Sulpa, sit by me, sir. Vice President RSST Dr. Vinod Hayagre and Vice Chancellor RV University Dr. Vyasar Murti to present the memento to Swami Nitya Asthananda Ji Maharaj. Vice Chancellor Adi University, Dr. Vyasar Murthy, wishes to be described as a proud alumnus of Sri Ramakrishna Mission High School, Main Branch, Chennai, and Vivekananda College, Chennai. A civil servant turned educator, he held a number of important assignments in the Government of India, National Human Rights Commission, and OP General Global University, Sonipat. I would now like to request Dr. Vaisar Murthy, Vice Chancellor of Avi University, to please give us the vote of thanks. So, with the respect rate, uh, committees on the NIS and other revered committees from the Ramakrishna Math, President of SST, Dr. Shyam, Dr. Vinod Haikri, Mr. Tata Raj, Ms. Maya Chandra. These head of institutions, faculty members, and dear students, on behalf of everyone present here, I wish to sincerely thank the head of Vedanta Society in New York, Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji Maharaj, and President Ramakrishna Mat Bangalore, Swami Vidyastha Nandaji Maharaj, for their inspiring lectures. All of us want to know answers to tough questions like who am I, the purpose of our lives and higher reality, our success and happiness are closely intertwined with finding right answers to these profound questions. Education is not mere acquisition of knowledge and skills, but it is in fact education for life as stressed by Swami Vivekananda in his very powerful words. We are therefore deeply grateful 
to these two senior monks of the Ramakrishna order for clarifying many of these matters, their visit to RV University and RV College of Engineering is a true blessing for all of us. Please give them a big round of applause. I am a proud alumnus of Sri Ramakrishna Mission Educational Institutions, having studied in them for seven years. And I am deeply grateful for all the values that I have learned during my formative stages. I want to make a small <coughs> announcement. An unknown donor has gifted Encyclopedia of Hinduism 11 volumes worth rupees 24,000 to the RV University Library through the Ramakrishna Mutt Bangalore. We are deeply grateful to the unknown donor and also to the Ramakrishna Mutt for this wonderful gift. <laughs> we offer India studies as a minor in the School of Liberal Arts and also philosophy. This compendium will prove very useful to our students, researchers, and faculty members. I have many people to thank for the successful conduct of today's talk. Dr. Mohan, Mr. Ranga, and the Dean School of Computer Science Engineering, Dr. Sanjay Chitnis, who worked tirelessly in facilitating the visit and this talk. I am deeply grateful to each one of them. I also wish to thank the President RSST, Dr. M.P. Shyam, Vice President Dr. Vinod Hayagri, Mr. Dattaraj and Ms. Maya Chandra for gracing this event. I also wish to thank Sri Narayana Swami, former Member of Parliament, Bangalore North, Mr. B. R. Patil, former MLA Gadak, and Mr. Uday Krishna, Secretary General, Shashadri Puram Group of Educational Institutions for attending this event. The principal RVCE, Dr. Supramanya, and his entire team, including Major Raghavendra, my colleagues in particular, the deans of various schools, Registrar Dr. Sahana Gowda, Facility Manager, Mr. Shachidhar, Head of Communication, Ms. Neha Goenka, Chandan, and others deserve appreciation for making necessary arrangements. I wish to thank <coughs> media representatives for covering this event. The Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Nikita Singh, and our student, Ms. <coughs> Ashleen, have done a nice job in comparing this event. I wish to thank each and every individual present in this hall for making this event a big resounding success. Jai Hind. Thank you, Professor Moti. We now request all dignitaries and the audience to stand up for the national anthem. Janak Namana Adhinayak Jayane Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Panjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Uttala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Uchala Chala Vitaranga Rava Shubha Name Jage Rava Shubha Ashish Mane Dahe Tava Jaya Dhaka 